right, I'm hitting go live. We're gonna try this again. I've had some troubles in the past with these live streams. So if you can hear me, if you can hear me loud and clear, please type in the chat and let me know that I'm not having audio problems this time. I'm really excited to be having another CCIE journey update, a live stream with you guys where we can talk about what our struggles and our challenges and our surprises are when it comes to interior gateway protocols. We're talking OSPF, EIGRP, and ISIS. Now, before I get started, let me check the comments real quick, make sure that those of y'all who are watching can hear me okay. Can you hear me? Just type in the chat and let me know. Okay, I hear someone says they can hear me. I guess we don't have any audio problems. So I am ready. I am ready to talk about this one because IGPs, this is a huge, huge topic. BGP, we talked about that last time. That's a big one on its own, but when you combine EIGRP, OSPF, and even a little bit of ISIS on this exam, they can amount to a lot. So here we go. I've got my Lebanese tea. I've got my pin. I've got my lab set up ready to rock and roll. So what we're going to do in this video is we are going to, you know, I'm going to bring up the lab. I'm going to talk about some of the things that surprised me. We'll look at the exam blueprint. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to move to Q&As because I love talking to y'all about what it is that you're experiencing. What do you think about OSPF, EIGRP, and ISIS? And then just go back. We can talk. It doesn't have to be about that. We can talk about the weather for all I care about. But if you want to talk about DNA Center, SD-WAN, automation, or any of the other things on the blueprint, that's what this whole session is about. This is just a way to communicate and share our journeys with each other. So let me change the scenes here. So we should be on the full screen with me. Let me get my mic situated. There we go. I think we are rocking and rolling. So here we go. We're, we're taking a look at, let me move the mic just a little bit. There we go. All right. So we're taking a look at the exam. Let's take a look at the exam blueprint first, actually. I think that's important to talk about uh, what is on the exam when it comes to the interior gateway protocols. Um, you know, we're going to have the things like the basic routing. You know, you, you could, a pretty strong argument here that uh, could be made that um, routing, uh, static routing is kind of an interior gateway protocol. And there are a lot of ways that you can engineer static routing with floating routes or tricking the, administ or the, the administrative distance. Um, and then, of course, how do you handle things within VRFs? That's all a big deal, too. So while that's not the entire purpose of this video, you know, there are still some, some pretty tricky things that you can do with static routing. But what we're really here to talk about in this video is OSPF, EIGRP, and ISIS. Now, let's talk about the popular one first, OSPF. Uh, OSPF, you know, that, that's the industry standard protocol. Um, and that seems to be, I guess I'm going to say it's the most popular protocol or the most popular interior gateway protocol that seems to be what's everybody's learning list. But when it comes to learning OSPF, there's those, you know, the LSAs. That's a big deal, the link state advertisements. And... Uh, for most people, I think that, uh, you know, maybe they're not, they're getting started in the CCIE journey or they're not even at the CCIE level. They're at CCNA or CCNP. When you start talking about LSAs, you start to fall asleep, right? Like it's, it's not, it's not the sexiest topic. It's not the most fun thing that we can talk about when we talk about the LSAs. But when you start getting in to the CCIE level stuff, that's when understanding how the protocol works exactly becomes really important because flooding, well, that's kind of a big deal when it comes to OSPF. Let me just check, make sure. Um, okay, so still no audio problems. I'm, I'm super paranoid about that after last week. Flooding is a big deal. You see, every there's a timer on all of these OSPFs that after the advertisement or the route goes, it starts ticking down like 60 minutes. And as that time ticks down, at some point, the router refloods all of its advertisements out again. And this flooding is becoming a big deal. This is why we have to have areas and we have to understand the scalability of OSPF. This plays a huge part in data center technologies where, you know, every little bit of bandwidth matters because we have huge amounts of data flowing throughout the data, the data center. And now controlling OSPF's link state advertisement flooding becomes a big deal. And this is why they bring in the different types of areas, the area types where it's not just, you know, the backbone area and then, you know, area one or area two, but we also can do things like stubs, total stubs, not so stubby areas and total not so stubby areas. 
And when you start jumping into CCIE practice exams or boot camps, you're going to be hit with things like create an area that does not allow type 4 or type 5 LSAs. And that's when you start going like, oh yeah, I do need to know my LSAs. And why do I need to create this area that doesn't have type 4, type 5 LSAs? That means we're not going to be allowing redistributed routes to be coming in through that point. External routes and ASBR advertisements aren't allowed in at that point. But then the details matter. I mean, we were talking about type 4 and type 5 LSAs in areas. Stop those from coming in, right? What about type 7? Type 7 means we can perform redistribution in this area. So if I were, hang on, hang on, let's clear this up. So let's say, and I'm going to actually, one second, one second, I'm going to make this pretty and, and understandable. Need my pen. <laughs> so let's say we have a router right here. We'll just call this like R1. Um, and let's say R1 participates in an area over here. Let's call this area zero. And let's say it participates in an area over here. Let's call this area one. And um, so we see the area zero, that's our backbone router uh, and our backbone area, it's our transit network. So that all of the other extraneous areas in order to get to them, they have to traverse through area zero. That's why area zero exists. It exists for transiting traffic through that to get from one end of the network to the other end. So let's say in area one though, we don't want all of these additional LSAs flooded through. We know that the area border router sends the type three LSAs, which means coming from one area to the other inbound, but we don't wanna have all these external routes being sent in too, which is gonna be the type four for the ASBR and the type five for the external routes. Uh, so that way, you know, we can just tell area one, look, just to get to anything else, just to get to these external routes, just send it back to the area zero and area zero will handle it from there. That's kind of the point here. We don't need to send all of these additional routes into this area if they're just gonna be taking one exit point anyways uh, out towards area zero. So that's why we can create a stub area here that stops the advertisements of four, five, and seven in that, area, in that case. But this is where the details matter. The exam may tell you something, create an area that stops the advertisement of LSAs four and five, but it didn't say seven, and that matters because we may have another router down here like router two, and that router may be participating in EIGRP over here, and we wanna bring those routes into this area. So that's where the type seven LSA comes into play. We can perform redistribution on R2, and that way it can go back to R1, and R1 will convert that type seven LSA into a type four and type five and send it back into area zero. So I know, I, like it gets very nuancy, and when you're talking about, when you're reading about LSAs in particular, you're like, Ugh, this is so boring. But then when you actually do it, when you actually get challenged, like make an area that controls the LSAs in this way, then you're like, oh, okay, yeah, now I actually do have to understand the inner workings of OSPF. And then more importantly is the design of it. Why do we control the LSAs in the first place? Well, there's the OSPF flooding, the LSA flooding that's gonna be a factor uh, in our network, the size of the network itself. And then what routers are going to be for our transit or our area zero backbone, what are going to be the ex extraneous routers. This also comes into a play when you've got DMVPN and hub and spoke topologies. So, that's kind of a whole thing. Let me check chat real quick, make sure uh, everybody can hear me clearly. Um, yeah, I think I think we've got one guy's having audio issues, but it sounds like everybody else can hear me clearly. So, uh, you know, I'm, and I'm checking my mic levels over here and I see that everything is working. So I'm just gonna keep going with it. Um, if you can't hear me, just make sure you're, you're blowing me up in chat. Uh, one person's asking if the microphone is turned on today. I, it shows me that the microphone is on. So uh, if you can't hear me, just please say in chat that you can't hear me because I don't want to do this again uh, where I do something embarrassing like that. So OSPF, let, let's talk about this in the sense of the CCIE. I felt like after studying for the NRC, recording for NRC, and peer reviewing our NRC content, the leap from NRC level OSPF to CCIE level OSPF was not that big of a leap. There weren't that many new concepts to learn 
It was more about when is the correct time to use them? What are the actual design and engineering scenarios of when to use them? So if I'm scrolling down here, um, you know, the big things that, that show up to me are like path preference, area and network types. So when we talk about area types, we're talking about uh, stub, not so stub, total stub, total not so stub. And network types is when we're talking about point to point versus point to point. Uh, you know, multi-point, broadcast, non-broadcast, and understanding when there's going to be a designated router election or a backup designated router election. Uh, there could be questions surrounding about that basic behavior of um, OSPF. And I think one of the biggest things to keep in mind is the default configuration of tunnel interfaces. Those default to point to point. And if you're trying to make a hub and spoke topology, you may change it to point to multi-point. And then that changes the timers. And OSPF doesn't form adjacency when the timers are off. Um, so, you know, adjacencies right there, that goes hand in hand with network types and area types. Um, the path preference, you know, and then there's like some, some security things here where you've got um, you know, prefix suppression. That's really aggregation, right? This is going to be the range command. Um, but when would you use the range command and how could you leverage that for traffic engineering? Maybe you've got two routers that exit your entire autonomous system, so to speak, and you perform aggregation on both of those, but maybe you try and leak some routes out or uh, change the distance or the, the metric on one to make one exit point more preferable. Those are the types of things that you may see on the CCIE, but the actual individual mechanisms themselves here, there, there's a couple things that are new. They're not terribly bad. It's just when do you use them that the CCIE, I think, steps it up a notch. The one that really rattled my bones, the thing that really, really caught me off guard was EIGRP. Look, here's the thing. I, I thought I knew EIGRP well, and I guess in many ways I, I did know EIGRP pretty well. Um, I certainly understood K values. I understood the feasibility conditions. Um, were there successors and feasible successors and how does that work? Uh, but this CCIE level EIGRP does introduce a whole lot more new features and functionalities and ways to use EIGRP, ways to engineer EIGRP. In fact, I would be so bold as to say, coming from CCNP level to CCIE level, this is the biggest leap out of all the topics. I, I'm just saying that for me, EIGRP was the one that blew my mind. And the thing that really helped me out the most was the CCIE Route Switch Version 5 Volume 1 textbook. And I'm pretty sure Peter Palut, I'm never going to be able to say his name right, but it's Peter Palut. Uh, and there's an accent on one of those vowels. Um, just... I mean, arguably one of the smartest people on earth, especially when it comes to networking, literally the author of the uh, IETF RFCs um, and it was the, uh, a co-author with Narvik, I think, uh, on this textbook. You can't ask for a better uh, textbook reading on EIGRP and the topics. And he talks about other things too, things that really blew my mind, like EIGRP over the top or OTPs for over the provider. Um, this is basically an alternative to DMVPN that uses Lisp and it uses EIGRP as the control plane. And that sounds super complicated, but it's just one command. And I demoed it on a live stream, or maybe it was a video, something on YouTube a few weeks back uh, when I was talking about OSPF and EIGRP musings. Um, I mean, it was, I don't know why we don't talk about that technology more or why it kind of fizzled out, but uh, super amazing and super powerful. Anyways, EIGRP. Um, so much stuff here, uh, leak maps and summary routes. Um, that's such a cool thing when it, or, uh, stubs with leak maps as well. So the idea with this is that with EIGRP, we can, you know, create a summary, you know, we've got 24 prefixes behind us. We want to advertise one summary, uh, you know, outbound. When we make these summarizations in EIGRP, we summarize them on the individual interface. So we would, if we have two upstream interfaces, you know, here they are, two upstream interfaces. We want to create a summary here, and we want to create a summary here. That way the neighboring routers upstream uh, both get the summaries, and one of them's not getting more specific prefixes. But there could be a scenario where we've got our 24 routes, and we're summarizing them upstream, but we want to leak 
one of those routes out this end. So that way, out of the slash, out of the 24 routes, we can send the summary plus one specific prefix out of that summary upwards. That's what the leak map does. This is very similar to the unsuppress map in BGP. It basically does the same thing. It's a summary, but we're not going to suppress one of those routes. And the idea is that when a more specific prefix goes out this end here, that means that that traffic is going to enter in through that way because everybody learns the more specific prefix and prefers the more specific prefix. The stubs kind of work the same way. When you configure an EIGRP stub, EIGRP is saying, hey, I'm the end of the line. Don't ever ask me where to find a route. If you lose a route, I'm not your guy. But with the, with the EIGRP, with the leak map, we could leak routes out and say like, well, you can ask me about this route because I'm advertising this route to you. That's kind of the idea with EIGRP leak maps. Now, interestingly, uh, on that note, there is something, a new feature called EIGRP stub sites. I believe this is covered in the Inarsi textbook. Uh, and it is, I, I'm going to go ahead and say that it is a cleaner, uh, better engineered version of EIGRP stubs with leak maps. Um, it's, it's what I would use in a similar situation where I had a stub, but I still wanted to advertise some routes upstream. I would use uh, an EIGRP stub site. Not hard to configure, um, but something pretty cool. Named mode, if you watched the MPLS Layer 3 VPN uh, videos this week that released on Monday, you saw how named mode beat me up. Um, because I forgot to, you could create multiple instances of name mode and therefore have multiple autonomous systems and redistribute between them. Um, looking at everything else, I mean, this operation section here, this is a whole lot of troubleshooting to help you out. Very cool thing about EIGRP is that it can do equal cost load balancing and unequal cost load balancing with the variance command. And along with the variance command, you can... Uh, you know, rig it to do fast reroute. Um, that's pretty cool uh, that you can do. I forgot what the command is, like um, minimum cost. I, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. I can't remember it off the top of my head. I could, if I had question marks, I could answer it for you. Um, and then lastly, ISIS. We'll talk about ISIS a little bit, and then I'm going to jump into questions. Thank you all for being so patient. Um, let's scroll down just a hair. ISIS is not one that they're necessarily expecting you to configure. But it does show up under design. Keyword there is design. It's going to be part of the design portion. Uh, in the underlay network for an SD access solution. When you use LAN automation for SD access, it automatically provisions all of the routing with ISIS. Beyond that, it does it with slash 31s. And this is one that I can show you uh, because it's part of the topology here. So let me go ahead and just bring up like my border two as part of my SD access fabric and let me move my, my fancy colors here. So if we take a look at this, we'll do enable, I can do like show IP route and you can see I've got some ISIS learned routes. These are level one routes. And you know, I, I don't know how deep we wanna get into how ISIS works today. It's, it's a link state protocol, very similar to OSPF, but it is a little different in the way that borders are drawn. You know, in OSPF, we can have a router and it can have one area here and one area here. And this is what makes it an area border router. And that's, of course, in OSPF. In ISIS, clear the screen. In ISIS, we have to have one router here and one router here. Let me draw circles here. And this is where their borders are drawn like this. And the level of the router determines if they can form neighbor relationships or not. So here we've got R2. Or, nope, we already got an R2. Let's call that R3. And here we've got an R4. So in, in level one relationships, all routers in the same area can form a relationship and have copies of the same database. Again, we're talking link state. So every, every router that's participating in it has a full copy of the database. And then similarly over here, this would be a level one relationship because R1 and R2 can connect together. But between areas, because this one might be area one and this one might be area two, if these routers are going to form a relationship, this has to be a level two relationship. So we can see already right here, it looks like when SD access, when, when DNA Center auto provisioned my entire underlay fabric using LAN automation, 
all of my neighbor relationships here are level one relationships. So now, why don't we actually just dig into it? Let's do show run section ISIS. And there it is. We could actually see uh, kind of right here, starting with router ISIS. So this right here, this is where it's kind of it's kind of funky. This is where it identifies the area as well as kind of a unique identifier on the area. Pretty much every example I've seen of ISIS is we specify 49. It's always just 49 in all the examples I've seen. Then this is basically the area number right here. In our case, we've got area zero. And then this section uh, is just something that uniquely identifies this device within the area. Lots of times that's a MAC address, and then it ends with .00. Um, of course, there's a lot more complication to ISIS than that. These numbers actually mean something more than that, but that's the, the quick crash course uh, for now. Um, we can see it you know, established a basic password. Um, it's using BFD on all the interfaces and logs adjacency changes. Pretty standard stuff when it comes to configuring ISIS. And then you actually configure ISIS on the interfaces themselves. So now if I do, let me bring up show IP interface brief one more time. Uh, I'm, let's pick on Ethernet 00. So let me do show run interface Ethernet 00. And there we go, right? Yep, right here. So IP router ISIS turns ISIS on on that particular interface. Why is this so interesting? Because ISIS, oh, this is another important one. Look at this right here, slash 31 addresses. ISIS can form these neighbor relationships. First of all, it can form a neighbor relationship without an IP address. ISIS was originally created not for the IP protocol. It was created for a different protocol. They only added the ability to work with the IP protocol after the fact, and they called it integrated ISIS after that. So interestingly enough, there's not like the, the whole neighbor relationship process doesn't rely on like multicast and broadcast, and we can use slash 31s to conserve address space here when it comes to bringing up the uh, the neighbor relationship. And then we can just turn ISIS on with IP router ISIS. Pretty cool. And that's that's the gist of how um, ST Access is going to be provisioning ISIS and why it's using ISIS. It conserves IP address space and it doesn't necessarily have to have an IP address in order to maintain a neighbor relationship. So those are the big things to keep in mind um, when it comes to that. Now, throughout the, um, the, the little lab here itself, we had a whole lot of fun, uh, and I ran into some challenges when I was recording for the practice lab. Um, of course, you saw me stumble right here uh, when we were trying to filter routes in OSPF. First of all, there's distribute lists, and then there's filter lists. The distribute lists are all about um, stopping a route from coming in to my routing table uh, that way a router doesn't necessarily learn about the route. But the big thing about OSPF and link state databases is every router has to maintain the same copy of the database. So with the distribute list, I'm, my router isn't going to install a route in the routing table, but it's still going to have it in the database and it's still going to forward that prefix to neighbors in the database too. The filter list on the other hand is filtering routes as they pass from one area to the next. And the big thing there is because this router, hang on, let me, let me move this one more time. This is getting kind of messy. The big thing there is that because this router right here was an area border router, you have to tell it, you know, from which area and which direction are we trying to filter. So if this was area 51, if I can write area 51, and I'm trying to filter a prefix, am I trying to filter the prefix as it enters area 51? Or am I trying to filter the prefix as it exits area 51? And that screws me up every single time. This is when it comes down to practice, memorization, practice, 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 more practice, and mental stamina. Did I mention practice? This is why we have these labs. You can't just roll into the CCIE and memorize facts. You got to practice these things over and over and over and over again. And these are the types of mistakes that I'm not going to commit again because now I've embarrassed myself publicly on the internet trying to answer my own practice exam. So understanding not only when to use a distribute list or a filter list, uh, but also the directions that they go in, those matter. Those matter a lot 
Um, and then, you know, when it comes to creating the prefix list and the route map that identifies those, are we permitting or are we not denying? You saw me screw that up too. We were trying to deny a route from going in a direction and I was trying to just say permit in order to match the route. Um, so that's, you know, another mental mistake, careless mistake that blew me up when I was going through this. Now, EIGRP, honestly, I'm pretty comfortable with EIGRP, uh, when it comes to basic routing and EIGRP, I screwed up huge on the MPLS layer three VPN videos because I was running EIGRP here. And then I wanted to run a separate instance of EIGRP there. And for whatever reason, my, my mind just imploded on itself and I ended up creating those VRFs on each side and then tried to redistribute between the VRFs which involved BGP and yeah, I mean, if you watched Monday's video, you saw uh, what happened. I hope you learned a lot because when we learned how routes come in through EIGRP over BGP VPN V4, back out into EIGRP, back into BGP, then back out into EIGRP, we saw the issue there. We saw how BGP is actually designed to carry the EIGRP attributes. It's designed to carry the autonomous system, all the K values and everything like that. Uh, so that way, you know, two disparate routers that are separated, that are EIGRP routers that are separated by BGP could still form neighbor relationships. That was the idea. That was why they designed it to do that. But in my case, EIGRP converged faster than it could get that information. And that's why all the routes were showing up as... Um, unreachable. But after you wait a second, it does get the information. You clear your routing table and then everything comes up fine. So that was, those were the things that have been catching me off guard. Those are the things that I'm practicing on. Uh, let me catch my breath. Let me let you guys talk. I'm going to look at the chat and make sure we've got some good questions going on here. I'm going to take a sip of my, my Lebanese tea here. Mm. Lebanese tea for the uninitiated is a Arnold Palmer, which is tea and lemonade mixed with some rose water. This is a very cool citrusy flavor. So let's see, any questions? Everybody saying the audio is good. Let's see. Yeah, so that is a good thing. Um, is ISIS the predecessor to OSPF? No, um, they were competing protocols uh, way back in the day. You know, I, I don't know exactly the day, um, but one was designed, OSPF was designed for the IP protocol. The other one was designed for uh, ISO or something like that. The idea was that ISIS was primarily going to be used in like airplane instrument panels and stuff like that. Uh, and then of course, you know, the IP protocol, the IP protocol just became the, the dominant king, the dominant factor, um, in how we do networking today. So, uh, ISIS decided to conform a little bit, um, and become, uh, you know, what, it, one second, give me, I'm a step away for one second. Let me show you something. Here we go. This book, this book came recommended to me, OSPF and ISIS. This, this draws the comparisons between them and when you would use one over the other or why you would use one over the other. It's written by Jeff Doyle, um, obviously an amazing author when it comes to, to routing. Uh, amazing diagrams about how the routes should look. Can't recommend this book enough. If you are interested in, should I use OSPF or should I use ISIS? They're both lean state routing protocols. Um, you know, large ISPs, large ISPs love ISIS. Um, a lot of them use OSPF because again, it's a comfort level thing. Like everybody's learning OSPF, uh, not necessarily, you know, you go through CCNA, you go through JNCIA, you even go through CCNP. There's not a single mention of ISIS unless you're specifically targeting a service provider track. I kind of think that's a missed opportunity there. Um, I, I really like ISIS. I really like how clean it is. Um, and I feel like clean is the right word for it. It's, it's scalable. I mean, it is different. It is a different mindset, but, uh, it is, it's quite fun to work with and it's, there's something beautiful in its simplicity. Tell you what, in our upcoming ENSLD, the design exam, the Insalad exam, what we're calling, uh, I, I got assigned the ISIS content and I'm quite frankly, very excited about it. You know, the, the exam topic is all about design and ISIS environment, but I feel like most people who are going through the enterprise track of Cisco, CCNP, uh, there's a very high chance that they've never seen ISIS before. So my intention is to actually record ISIS fundamentals 
um, and, you know, bring an ISIS network to life before we talk about how you design an ISIS network. And then understanding those types of things and how it's still a link state database, I think that's really going to help you uh, as you move into OSPF too, because then you start understanding how OSPF differs and how they're the same at the same time, which I think is pretty cool. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, let me make sure I'm just keeping up. Um... <laughs> I'm still laughing at that. Is the microphone turned on today? That's so funny. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, just taking a look again one more time. Oh, yeah, of course. How could I? How could I miss this? Um, where else would you see routing protocols outside of up here? Uh, you know, your routing protocols are all going to be in SD WAN. SD WAN, when you are working with a V Edge, is capable of doing BGP and OSPF. And when you're working with a C Edge, which is going to be your CSR 1000V, or even some other newer platforms that are making it, the idea is this is Bittella, this is Cisco. Um, now you can do BGP, OSPF, as well as EIGRP. So you can actually use SD-WAN to push down EIGRP configurations and run IGPs within each of your sites uh, and use SD-WAN to manage it that way. And these are going to be done right here in the templates section. So 2.2c, configuration templates, very vague, but extraordinarily powerful. Um, I'm going to venture to say that if you were deploying SD-WAN for the first time, uh, you'll probably spend 40% of your time in templates and 60% of your time in policies. Um, and probably moving forward, maintaining new sites or adding new sites, again, it's going to be about the same breakdown, I bet. Like the majority of your time is going to be spent in templates and policies. So when it says things like configuration templates, localized policies, centralized policies, it makes it, you know, just one little bullet point with two words makes you think, ah, oh, that's probably nothing to it. And, mm, no, that's the entire point of SD-WAN. So... Uh, you know, keep that in mind that we're talking about routing protocols, but routing protocols don't necessarily just have to show up in this 30% up here. The next things to keep in mind on top of that are IGPs determine the outcome of other protocols too, like multicast. If you watch my video on Wednesday where I went through multicast, I struggled with EIGRP, right? And there were routing issues and I created those VRFs. Well, guess what? Multicast doesn't work unless it has connectivity on the underlay or all of the interior gateway protocols. So it uses the reverse path forwarding in order to check. I'm trying to figure out where RPF check is somewhere in here. You would think that it would say, I mean, I guess it has to because, oh, right here, 1.6B, reverse path forwarding check. So the idea is if I'm running multicast here on all of these different routers and it looks like this and uh, a multicast packet is coming in through this way, uh, if this router down here would send it out this way by default, if it would reply in that direction, then it's not going to accept the packet. It, it, it checks as packets come in if it came in through the same path that it would reply to. That's the reverse path forwarding check. So if you rig EIGRP to send traffic this way, but reply to traffic this way, basically an asynchronous route, uh, your whole multicast environment is going to be hosed. And then, of course, you throw VRFs in the mix like I did. And, you know, just good luck, have fun. Um, so that's why, you know, understanding what we're doing with the IGPs isn't just good enough to make bring neighbor relationships to life. Uh, you could also make the same argument with uh, MPLS. Oh, did I hit a button? I think I hit a button. No, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I did hit a button, but it, it popped up on my other screen. Look, y'all, I'm telling you, these, these live streams really beat me up. <laughs> I don't have the miracle of editing behind me here. Um, so, you know... There is a very real possibility that you could get an SD-WAN challenge. You could get a multicast challenge. You could get an MPLS challenge on your CCI exam, and it's actually not an SD-WAN challenge. It's actually not a multicast challenge. It could be the underlay is broken. So, you know, maybe start with the most obvious things first. Just do ping tests. See if we can, if we have the right connectivity, or do trace routes. See if we're going the right direction in the first place. Uh, before we start blaming, oh, it's SD-WAN, oh, it's MPLS, oh, it's multicast, because it might just be OSPF or EIGRP. 
Let me check one more time. Will the SD WAN and design videos be on CBT Nuggets released before 2021? Uh, SD WAN should be done next week, um, so I would expect it to be released in the coming two or three weeks. So um, happy holidays! Uh, design that that would be cutting it pretty close. Um, we're doing dev, so I'm finishing score this upcoming week. Keith still has some score and some security plus to record. Jeff is I think he might actually be going straight into the design course and start recording there. Uh, I have dev core after I finish score. Um, so I would expect me to start recording design end of October or beginning of November. And I would expect me to take about a month to record it. Um, I can't speak for Keith or Jeff, but it like if it comes out before January 2021, it'd be right at the very end. Um, so that the design one may be a little tight there, uh, but it, it, you know, it's on the way. I'm telling you that right now. We've kicked it off. We've got our assignments, um, and it's, it's happening. Um, afterwards, let me go ahead and tell you this right now, because I've been getting a lot of requests for it. After design is done, I want to go straight for SP core. Uh, I want to do service provider core. Look, here's one of the things when we're talking about all of these IGPs, OSPF, EIGRP, um, ISIS, multicast, those are big service provider technologies, maybe not EIGRP, but there's a huge amount of overlap between the stuff we do in CCNP Encore and CCNP Service Provider uh, and CCIE Enterprise and CCIE Service Provider. I mean, you know, maybe it's 6040 or 6633, something like that, but there is overlap. And that's why one of my intentions is to do service provider studying in addition, in preparation for enterprise. Because check this out, I mean, we scroll down, we get to the VPN technologies, transport technologies, and guess what? Look, I mean, MPLS and MPLS Layer 3 VPN, that's a service provider a service provider gets. I'm sure there are some enterprises out there that operate in these things. I've never worked with them. But service providers do this. This is literally what they do all day long. So, uh, you know, why not? Why not study those things if you've got the time? Okay, so recently... A little spoiler, I was on a podcast, uh, a very popular podcast, and I'm not going to spoil too much. Um, but one of the things that we were talking about when people are talking about preparing for their CCIE is you get fed a lot of information that influences you in the wrong way when it comes to preparing for your CCIE. All of these people talk about, like, I studied six hours a day for six straight months every single day, and I gave up all this stuff. Why? Why? why what what was your deadline is that do i have a deadline to take this ccie no i don't and that's the thing is like i i could kill myself studying around the clock and preparing for all this stuff but i don't have to i could take the ccie one year from now and i may end up having to do that because the lab centers are never going to open so the thing is is like why stress and hold myself to some of these like these kind of obnoxious levels of studying hours upon hours upon hours upon hours, upon hours of every single day when I could take a healthy pace and still arrive at the same endpoint. That's just my thing, y'all. It, it, you know, when we look at each of these topics individually, some of them are kind of challenging, but for the most part, uh, they're, each individual item here isn't that bad, uh, especially if you take your time learning it. Don't feel rushed. Um, yeah, so anyways, that, that was my soapbox there that, you know, I could take my time and do some service provider technologies, I think going through SP Core would really help me in preparation for the CCIE exam. All right, let me, let me look at some other stuff here. Uh, let's see, any more questions uh, for lab exam? Are we going to use a specific, okay, this is a good one. At the lab exam, are we going to use any specific lab simulator like CML2, or how does it work? Are we going to use secure CRT, putty, Anything about that. So it is virtualized. We know that um, with the exception of DNA Center and the physical switches that you may have to use, you know, for LAN automation. Um, we don't know which platform for virtualization they're using. If I had to guess, it would be viral or CML. Um, they did tell us specifically uh, somewhere out there. There is there is a website um, for the images. In fact, you know what? Like this is a live stream. Let's find it. CCIE exam version, images, something. Let's just start Googling. Um, enterprise infrastructure training. 
The, the info is out there somewhere where they tell us it might be here. Ah, right there. Equipment and software list. I bet that's it. No, login page. Let's see. <laughs> of course. Um, there, there's, there is, they tell us what they use specifically. They even tell us like the version of um, the operating system. And, oh, come on, please be the one. I would love this. Nope, URL no longer exists. Wah, wah, wah. Um, there's the topics, which we're already talking about. I'll find it and I'll put it in the comments or somewhere, but they have told us uh, specifically which images they use, which versions they use. Um, the, the, the terminal tool is kind of like a multi-tab putty. They've shown that off in one of the webinars too. It's not secure CRT, it's not putty, and I don't even think it's MT putty, but it's kind of like it. Uh, the they told us like which IDE they use for Python, um, which version of Python. So they, they did provide all of that information and it was in a webinar. Oh man, I really wish I could have found it so quickly. Um, Shoot, I'm sorry about that. We'll find it, uh, and I will get that information sent over to you. Uh, webinars and videos, maybe? Oh, now I think we're on to the right track, you guys. Mm, oh, man. I don't want to waste y'all's time too terribly much here. Uh, maybe if y'all have it, you could... Recorded webinar. Nope, that's wireless. Enterprise and web... That one. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think this was this was the section that we were looking for. Um, lots of good learning stuff here. Anyways, uh, I'll find all of it, I promise, um, and I'll post it in the comments, I'll post it in the description. Uh, they did have a great webinar where they actually introduced us to the entire uh, exam environment itself. They actually showed the exam environment. They showed like how you would launch and interact with these devices. Um, and they talked about how to even prepare for it. Now, at one point, at one point, they talked about that they would even provide the Linux box itself as a VM for you to practice with so that you could get to know the GUI and the tools and the interfaces. There wouldn't obviously be any questions, like exam questions in there, but it would, you know, help familiarize yourself with it. Uh, I really hope they follow through with that because I would really use it for sure. I would hate to get into the lab environment and not know how to use those tools. Um, let's take a look. Uh, somebody says it's super putty, so that could be it. That could be the case, that it's super putty. Um, and, you know, get to know super putty and get to know those IDEs. Um, so, I mean, this is this is some pretty fun stuff. I'll tell you, uh, you know, some spoilers coming up this week. Monday, we're releasing the DMVPN Dual Hub Phase 3 video. That's going to be the DMVPN Dual Hub Phase 3 challenge. And then Wednesday, we're going to be releasing the SD Access Challenge. I know y'all are excited about that. There is no DNA Center. Um, but you know, the, the challenge itself was built around handing off from the fabric to the fusion routers. And that is quite frankly, the hardest part of deploying an SD access fabric. Uh, it will take you 45 minutes to an hour to do it. Um, if you do it correctly and know what you're doing. So yeah. Um, what else do we have here? Do we have any more questions, comments, concerns? Um, how do you think I'm doing? How are you doing? How are you doing with all these changes that are happening in the world? Um, where are you in your journey? What could I do to help you on your journey? Those are the things that I want to know. And you've got me. So let's, let's handle them. SD-WAN stuff is fun, y'all. It's hard. It's different. It's definitely different, but it's fun. I think y'all, y'all will, y'all will enjoy those SD-WAN challenges. Oh, somebody's got the link. Sweet. Thank you all for your feedback. Um, and, and thank you for joining me along with these things. Uh, I, have, I am having the best time just creating labs and playing around with things and, you know, giving it a show IP route and seeing all those routes come to life. Um, makes me happy to see when this stuff happens. So one of the things that, you know, I look at this and I see like inter-area routes and, 
external type one routes. Uh, and my head now goes towards LSA types. Um, and looking at them within each area, you know, this is, this is why I'm glad I did this. This is why I'm glad I went through my CCI journey and really understood OSPF more and why you design it the way you do it and why you control it the way you do it. Uh, really makes me appreciate EIGRP too. Um, distance vector protocol, so powerful, so fast, um, easy to engineer once you understand it. Uh, but again, that leap uh, from CCNP level to CCIE level EIGRP, that was the one that made me go... Am I ready for the CCIE? I don't even know. That's that's the thing. So that like if you're new to this, if you're following along for the first time, my advice to you is don't feel bad about the leap for EIGRP. OSPF is the big one. All right, I see some more chat coming out here. Let's see. Oh yeah, they did just send out the SD WAN book. You're cor you're correct. They did. Um, and Amazon sent me an email that said, "Do you still want this book? Because we're having a hard time getting it." And I'm like, "Man, just digital." <laughs> um, the webinars, you know, I can't see any links that are getting posted there, but uh, the webinars that I saw, so there was a, a man, I really got to find that webinar. Um, Peter did the webinar, and it would have been under CCIE, and you would think it'd be under CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure Reported Webinars, but these are all like plan activity things. These are lessons, and that's not what I did. Um, and I really don't want to just waste y'all's time and you just sit there and watch me Googling unless y'all start like texting me right now and saying like, yeah, take your time, Google, and then I'll do it. But it's, I just hate to watch somebody struggle. <laughs> um, let's see. Where can you, okay, so I mean, we are getting people asking like, where can you find the webinars that go over the CC, okay, let's do CCIE webinar exam environment. Um... Ah, oh, this might be it. This is looking, might be better. Is this it? Well, there's the WebEx. <laughs> this is where they announced it. Ah, nope, <laughs> man. Takes me back here, shoot. Certifications training videos, maybe this could be it. Oh, this is it. This is it. Okay, so to get here, uh, hang on. I'll put this in chat. There you go. This is it. This is what I was looking for. Okay, so the ones that you care about. Um, deep dive on the CCIE lab environment. And... CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure Overview Scope and Presentation Preparation. Um, so this, this first one, uh, tells you about the literal environment itself. What OS are you going to be using? What tools are you going to be using? What are the images that are going to be using? How is the lab delivered to your computer? Uh, things like, are there multiple monitors? There are now. Um, and then this is, what are the questions going to be like? What are What is new on the exam? What was taken off of the old exam? Uh, what is the design module really all about? Uh, these webinars, and I, I did a, I went, I went live as soon as both of these webinars were over. So if you check my YouTube channel, you can catch my feedback uh, on these webinars. I think if you like go to my YouTube channel, you'll see a live streams like playlist and they'll be in there. Um, but these are the two webinars that you want to care about. And again, um, if you go to the webinars section, uh, this was under CCIE certifications training videos. These aren't specific to any CCIE. Um, and what's pretty cool here is like this talks about the enterprise infrastructure one, but if you are going for uh, security, data center, collab, service provider, or wireless, they have webinars on each one of them. Um, so here they are. Uh, so sorry that I had to spend all that time Googling to find it, uh, but there it is. And there's the link in the chat uh, for you to check out. Um, and they, it really is like this was an in-depth webinar that really enlightens you as to what's going to be on the exam and uh, what are the actual environments to um, highly recommend following Peter on Twitter. 
um, the person who was presenting these webinars. He just, if you're not involved in tech Twitter, uh, even if you don't tweet, just just start following people. <laughs> just do it because there's so much info out there, and that's where like breaking news happens. Um, so yeah, that's and 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 tech Twitter for networking is one of the safest places, ironically, that there are. Can't say the same for JavaScript Twitter or InfoSec Twitter, but but networking Twitter is phenomenal. It's great. Um, so you know. Obviously, I would ask for you to follow me, but I don't, you know, if you don't follow me, that's fine. Um, but do follow the people who are influencing this type of information, like Peter, who is presenting uh, in this in this particular exam. Um, you know, wrapping up here, we got ten minutes left. Uh, just you know, trying to think if there's anything else y'all want to talk about. Do you have any SD WAN questions? Any design questions? Uh, SD Access, are you interested in the SCORE course? That's actually a good question. Uh, do y'all have any interest in the other uh, platforms within the Cisco training infrastructure? Do you, are you interested in security? Are you interested in collab? Uh, are you interested in service provider? Um, I would love to know that. I would love to hear below in the comments or uh, the chat, uh, what, what other, if it's not enterprise for you, what is it that you're interested in? Or are you strictly an enterprise person? That's all you care about. Um, and then within the new enterprise infrastructure track, uh, out of all of these things that are listed here, which one of these excites you the most? Is it automation? Probably not, is it? <laughs> is it DNA Center? Is it multicast? Probably not. Um, is it QoS? Uh, let me know about those things. QoS still terrifies me. Um, yeah, I, I just, I'd really like to hear more about you and your journey and your stress. What are you working on? Um, is it time management? You know, is, is that what the issue is? Or is it finding a, a study group or a buddy? That's that's what I'd love to hear more about. Yep, there's someone who's already commenting saying they're interested in service provider. Uh, someone says DC Core, SP Core, trying to decide. Already passed enterprise. That's awesome. Um, I mean, can't go wrong with DC Core because data centers are everywhere, right? And as long as you're in a medium-sized environment, you're working with some form of data center. Uh, do you work with ACI? Do you work with Nexus switches? Uh, or do you work with UCS? Do you work with UCS manager or UCS director? Uh, that That is some intimidating and big stuff. And uh, Jeff Kish is just phenomenal at it. Service provider, I think for me... If software-defined networking scratches is, is what's scratching your itch, then you, you might lean towards DC Core because that is, you know, that's really where I think a lot of software-defined networking is really finding its roots. ACI was so popular and so powerful, and UCS Manager and Director are so popular and so powerful that it's spilling over into enterprise networking. Whereas service provider, I'm not going to say it's behind, but they just do so many different things um, if routing is really like you're really into routing protocols and, you know, watching the adjacencies come to life, uh, service provider may be the one for you. And I think that's why after going through the CCIE journey, I've become more and more and more interested in service provider technologies. You're taking Encore tomorrow. That is awesome. Uh, good luck. Preemptive congrats. Um, you know, hope you're hope you're rocking that boson practice exam because that was a critical part to why I was able to successfully pass uh, the encore exam. And RC and an auto, that's one of those things like you can't you can't. There's no wrong choice there. In RC is going to step your skills up a notch. It's going to give you a great first step towards CCIE uh, level level routing, especially in OSPF, especially in multicast, and especially in BGP. Not so much in EIGRP. Uh, but that first 30% domain, you know, you're off to a good start. With Inauto, let me say this. Um, I am actually glad that I did Inauto before I did things with Inarsi because it took more time to learn Python. It took more time to learn, uh, you know, how APIs really work. It took more time to learn how the HTTP protocol really works. And then I had to learn how to apply all of that to the Cisco platforms themselves. And I feel like if I had done Encore and then done an RC, but not done an auto, if I had then just gone straight to CCIE, when I got to the automation studies of CCIE, I would have felt really discouraged because I would have felt like I had to start all the way over with all of these new technologies 
that would have taken me forever to learn, even though they don't take forever to learn. But it would have felt very, very difficult. It would have felt like it would have been a mountain to climb in order to tackle a small portion of the CCIE exam. I am glad that I did in auto first, and I'm glad that I forced myself out of my comfort zone. And real, I mean, I did really good on that exam too. I took DevCore and an auto back to back. I actually came out of that exam. Uh, I took, I came out of DevCore. I said, "Don't give me my score results. I don't want to know. Just fire up the an auto exam. I'm going to go take that." Um, so I, I took them back to back. I think two days after the exams were released, I took DevAsk on a Tuesday and DevCore and an auto on a Thursday. Uh, and I am so glad that I, I went through all of that first. So that way, when it came time to study for my CCIE, I could just focus on filling in gaps with routing, switching, and services. Let's see what else we got here. Can you send me info on joining a study group, please? I would say check out Twitter. Uh, there are lots of great study groups. Um, and also, believe it or not, the Art of Network Engineering podcast. There's lots of people there who talk about study groups. Uh, beyond that, CBT Nuggets. There, I think it's cbtnuggets.com slash community. Let's check it out. cbtnuggets.com slash, is it community? I want to say it's community. Yeah, right there. Um, so if you are a CBT Nuggets subscriber or if you're on the trial, we actually have a Slack community for all of the different topics that people are studying. So there is like a Cisco Learners channel that you can, you know, jump in and study with people, you know, paste running config and say, why isn't this working? Uh, that's why we set this up. So for subscribers of CBT Nuggets, you actually have a learner community. There is even a mentorship program with it so that you can set up goals or objectives or timelines. I am sometimes involved in this Slack community too. So you can tag me with questions. Um, same thing goes for Twitter though. You can find ways to reach me, uh, you know, out there in the wild. Um, let's see. Do they still have frame relay and service provider? Pretty sure it's not on the exam blueprint. So that's a good question. Uh, let's do, let's find out. Let's see. SP core exam topics real quick. Um, I want to make sure before I say no to this, but I'm pretty sure they don't. Uh, architecture, looking for anything that says frame relay. Not seeing it, not seeing it, not seeing it, not seeing it. Networking, looking for anything that says frame relay, not seeing it. MPLS and segment routing, definitely not going to be there. Uh, services, which is lots of VPN technologies, not seeing anything there. And then automation insurance. No, I don't see any frame relay there on the service provider exam for the SP core. I would expect S, I would expect the CCIE service provider to be this plus the electives, um, kind of like how the CCIE enterprise is. Um, is there any prep in CBT Nuggets for in auto? It's already out. Um, so if you go uh, to learn.gg slash data and it brings up my page where all the content I've created, and it's right there, right there, this one. So yeah, there's the Inato course right here. Um, you can also see our other courses, Encore, NRC, DNA Center, um, ENS, DWI, the SD-WAN course. I mean, really keep your eyes peeled. It's coming very soon. Um, and then in Salad, uh, coming after that, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, but maybe early next year. Uh, let's see what else we got. Um, let's see. Main reason you're interested in in auto is so you can get DevNet Professional, but you feel like you need to have Inarsi in order for people to take you seriously as a CCNP. Wow. Man, I love that comment. It, because, hey, right there with you. I got DevAsk. Two days later, I got DevNet Professional. Still felt like nobody took me seriously. Still felt like an imposter. Yeah, I'm exactly with you right there. So all it took for me to get my CCNP was upgrade that with my Encore exam. So I took, what did I take? DevNet, DevCore, in auto and Encore. Three exams, got me DevNet Professional and CCNP. Do I feel like people didn't take me seriously after that? Uh, I could see why you feel that way. Uh, what I would say is prove them wrong because automation is happening. It's a thing. And you don't have to pass NRC to be good at routing. You can still study NRC and you can still go for your CCIE. 
that's kind of the thing. As long as you pass Encore, you're qualified to go for your CCIE, right? So you could, you know, just, just like I did, I got my CCNP by passing Encore in an auto, and then I recorded for an RC. I read the NRC textbook twice. I feel very comfortable with all those topics. And then I went straight for the CCIE exam level topics. Even if I don't take the exam, I still feel comfortable in my skin that I have expert level routing, switching, and services under my belt now. And I feel like if someone were to challenge me, I could stand on my own two feet and I don't need a certification to prove that anymore. So uh, do what you want. Don't feel like an imposter. Prove the haters wrong. Let's see. Moving from help desk to network engineering, lots of network engineering jobs seem to ask for CCNP than CCNA. That is such an interesting point. I do feel like CCNP is the new CCNA uh, out there in the job market. The first thing I'll tell you is ignore the requirements and apply anyways. Apply to every single job that you want, regardless of if you meet the requirements or not. If you get in the interview and somebody's telling you like, well, you don't have CCNP. <laughs> I have a CCNP. And, you know, they're acting kind of elitist about it. Um, tell them that you will work harder than anyone who has their CCNP, as long as that's the truth, as long as you actually will. There is a difference between having skills and wanting skills. And me as a hiring manager, I always hired potential. I would rather hire someone who is inspired and motivated than someone who is entitled. That's just my thought there. Uh, that's not to say that that's not what HR is out there. And that's not to say that that's not what you know people are hiring. Um, because I sure as hell got turned down for a lot of jobs that, you know, I'm hoping they look back at me and go, man, we missed out on that one. <laughs> you know, that's just part of it, though. Some people, you know, don't want to hire someone that they have to train. They want to hire someone that can do the work day one. Nine times out of ten, they don't stick around because that's just kind of how it is. So uh, that's my thought on that one. That's a, that's a good, a very real and good question. Um, registering for Security Lab now and studied the one else on the way. Been in the industry for 10 years. Um, took a break due to discrimination. Wow, I'm really sorry to hear that happen to you. Um, congrats on having De Dev Ask and super excited to hear about your security lab journey. Um, that is really, really cool stuff. Um, let me know what I can do to help you along that way too. We are recording score content. Um, I know you know that may be beneath you at this point, um, but we have intentions of filling out that security, security portfolio at CVT Nuggets, and I would love to start talking about how you could do labs to help with that lab work too. Is ACI still around in CCNP Cloud? Is there a CCNP Cloud? ACI is definitely around in DC Core and the data center stuff. And Vishal says he needs help to complete a CCNP exam preparation. Would love to know which CCNP exam you need help with. If it's Encore or Narsi, Inauto, uh, SD-WAN, we've got the training or the training's coming on CBT Nuggets. And don't overlook the Boson exam sims. And a lot of my videos here on CBT Nuggets, um, if you look in the description, there's links to go straight to those Boson exam sims where you can purchase them. And lots of times there's promo codes too. So look for promo codes, but just fire off one of those links and buy those boson exam sims. I mean, they really are the make or break difference for me when it comes to those types of exams. I can't stress that enough. Encore. Yeah, so Encore. Boson exam sim, CBT nuggets, OCG, the official cert guide will help too. Um, again, the I can send you a link. Let me hang on, let me chat. Let me chat it. We're gonna chat it. I'm gonna bring up this. Here, let's do http colon slash slash learn dot gg slash data nox. That's where you can find the video training. Um, and let me minimize this. I'll show you if I go to youtube.com real quick, we'll just bring up one of my videos, um, your channel. And just like any one of these videos here uh, probably has it. Like I passed Encore. Let's just, just pause this and go to the descriptions. 
where is the description show more yep right here see these links right here uh the boson encore exam that's the one you want trust me that that exam sim it literally was the difference maker for me in passing that exam uh, of course, you know, I use CBT Nuggets. I peer-reviewed the content. I recorded content. I read the textbook. But the exam sim, like I probably could have passed on that point, but the exam sim is what set me over the top and gave me a huge confidence level when I burst into that exam. So can't recommend that enough. Okay, and then the last request here we'll take is uh, the... The lab tasks themselves in the community edition, I'm still trying to work out a way to do that. Put it on GitHub or put it in a zip file. Um, that is a request I get pretty frequently, and I'm trying to iron out ways to do it. Uh, just keep your eyes peeled. In the, at, at the very worst scenario, you can watch the video, pause it, and jot down the, the lab tasks. You can even comment those lab tasks in the comments below on all the videos so that way other people have them and you know you're using your superpowers for good. Um, that's a good thing too. So I appreciate that feedback too. Um, and that could be a great way to handle it for sure. So we're five minutes over. I'm going to cut the live stream off here. Thank you all so much for joining. Thank you, Lord above, for not having audio troubles this time. Uh, I have so much fun communicating and talking with y'all. Next week, we're going to be talking about VPN technologies, then it's software-defined networking, then it's automation. And that's how we'll wrap up the CCIE journey and the practice lab here. So keep your eyes peeled. Monday, we've got the DMVPN phase three video launching. Wednesday, we've got the SD access video launching. Then Fridays, we're doing the practice, we'll study practice sessions that these are. Uh, and then the following week, we're wrapping up with SD-WAN and automation. So have fun, enjoy your week, be good to one another, and thank you all for joining me. We'll see you on the next one.